This podcast is brought to you by LMU Munich. <laughs> so, hello everybody. So, I know you now feel a little more relaxed after having met your team colleagues. It's my pleasure to talk to you about One Health Challenges. Um, well, you know, the European University Alliance is for global health. UCLO is global health. So why One Health? Well, actually, we recently started a One Health Network at LMU together with partners in Latin America, Asia, and Africa. So I thought, oh, it might be a good idea to talk about One Health challenges during the UCLO Innovation Day as well. But this was before Corona, um, and I think um, now more than ever, and Professor Biagini already mentioned it, now more than ever, um, it's time to talk about One Health. So why that? Well, when we look at uh, COVID-19, we have all these medical I think the sound is not working anymore. Or is it just me? No. Yeah, there's no sound anymore. Maybe you. Oh yeah, no sound, unfortunately. So maybe we have to. No. Oh, I was just on mute while trying to improve the video. Sorry for that. So maybe it's not always the best to have to log in twice. So let's see. Can you hear me now? Yes. yes. Okay. So please let me know as soon as someone something is not working. So first um the veterinarians were the first to know about coronavirus, to, about COVID-19, as it seems that it first affected animals and then spread to human beings. And then with this, the medical doctors, all the medical field faced challenges as it started to spread from animals to humans, from human to human, from one country to another country within hospitals, so nosocomial transmissions to other patients in homes for the elderly and so on. And we saw this challenging situation, this from last Saturday, how the number of confirmed cases increased all over the world from uh, the beginning of this year to now. It moved a bit around the world. At the moment, we have the biggest challenge in Latin America. In Europe, it's quite, it has quite improved over the last couple of days and weeks, but we are pretty sure that the second wave will be coming back. So here's the challenge how to um, improve the situation, how to avoid spread of disease, and uh, what to do to protect human beings. But all the measures behind, all the measures not only are affecting the medical field, it's also something which is affecting aspects related to social and behavioral sciences. So how do we percept the threat? How's our emotional and risk perception? Also the situation produces prejudice and discrimination. And there are people panicking, just as one example from the school of my kids, where there are some parents who say, well, let us send the kids back to school. They need schooling and they can't stay home longer. We are getting crazy with the kids around all the day. And then there are the other parents, maybe those who have uh, sick parents or sick themselves who are panicking. When our kids go back to school, how could we um, protect ourselves, how could we protect our children, how could we protect our parents, so there are all these issues. And then there is a big component also in the social behavior science of leadership, and here we also come to political sciences. Is there trust and compliance in our politicians? Then um, there are 
the individual interests, so everyone buying toilet paper, and then there are the collective interests, so our society, our country needs to be safe. Then there's something about how we communicate sciences. If you don't communicate well, and we have seen this especially over the last two or three weeks that the conspiracy theories are booming. And when you look at the internet, sometimes you think um, this can't be true that people tell us um, or follow these conspiracy theories. I, I just told my kids about them, they are primary school age, and they couldn't believe that people really believe such stupid things. So, uh, but uh, all this situation makes that people start um, believing in such fake news. Then there's the social context, and the social context is different in all of our societies, and it might be even more different when we go to Africa, Asia, Latin America. And then there is the question, how do we cope with all the stress? And not the, only this, there's also the social isolation and lack of connection. There was even a European study indicating that loneliness is not what's affecting most those over the age of 65 years. So you might think, oh, they are lonely now because they don't receive visits from their grandchildren and so on. No, it's more the younger ones and those who are poor and unemployed who really have increased in their feeling of loneliness. But we also have good news behind it. And all of you know these figures. This is a comparison of the NO2 pollution in Europe. One, uh, the picture above is showing us the situation in Europe uh, from March uh, 2019 to A April 2019. And you see how much we are affected, especially the big cities, how we are affected by NO2 pollution in the troposphere, and this is the figure one year later when everything was locked down, and you see how much our air pollution has improved. So not only bad news, and maybe that's something uh, we have to take from this, and it's also related to the citation um, Professor Viagini also already gave us from Albert Einstein, maybe we have to take this challenge and make the best of it. So what does the European Union see as the most important one health challenges for the European Union in the COVID-19 pandemic? Well, they identify, and this is a picture I took um, around 10 days ago from the European Union, they identified six key areas where they see there, these are the challenges to the European Union and these have to be faced. So one is limiting the spread of the virus. This was done and is still done by a temporary closure of the EU external borders. There is um, change border management. Then they ask for risk assessments for the EU population and they also try to coordinate the situation weekly just to have an optimal political crisis response. The other area um, where the EU is, uh, is focusing on and, and what, does they, what they identify as one health challenge is the provision of medical equipment for the whole European society um, so that we have enough, enough protective gear um, to protect European citizens. The third area is to promote research for treatments and vaccines, because most likely there will never ever be enough people protected from the virus just by um, slowly have more people infected and this way get a herd immunity, but we will really we will need to rely on treatments and vaccines and they need to be evidence-based and not just um, like some presidents uh, say, okay, this is the medication, we just take it and we know what's best for our community. No, this needs to be evidence-based. 
The other concern of the European Union and the other challenge for Europe is, and not just for Europe, is the economy and how to help the European economy in this really tough situation. We already talked about disinformation and this is also a challenge identified by the European Union. We need better information, we need timely correcting of misinformation, we need to be transparent in politics and we need to base our communication on facts. So having said that and giving you an idea about what the European Union sees as one health challenges in the COVID-19 situation. Um, now I'm looking forward to your innovations to combat the one ch health challenges of COVID-19. This might be, for example, something to combat the conspiracy theories and to improve the information within Europe or how to better connect people who are lonely in this situation or something very easy um simple very simple which is at least for me not so easy to solve is when we use our protective our epp our personal protective equipment that we won't get foggy classes so these are just examples for innovations which i could imagine um coming out of these next two and a half uh, days from your ideas and I'm really looking forward to see them on Wednesday when you will present your solutions. Thank you.